I'm Julia Arliss from Academy Conferences and I'm here in the Divinity Library of Aberdeen University today with Professor Grant McCaskill. And um, Grant, I just wanted to ask you a few quick questions if that's alright. And um, I'm just wondering if you could just explain for us why you think that some of our sixth form students might want to study theology. Well, I think the most important answer to that is just that the material is so interesting and continues to be very relevant. Uh, every year, I and my colleagues go to a big conference in America uh, that probably has now maybe 10,000 people who attend. And these are all researchers who are developing fresh research into the Bible and the theological traditions and uh, looking at things that range from the historical reliability of the biblical material through to more up-to-date relevant questions perhaps for many such as uh, the ethics of transhumanism, or the ethics of gene modification, or the technological future. And I think that's a window onto the fact that this is material that continues to be historically very significant, and that's never going to go away. Mm -hmm. But it's also material that is of pretty enormous contemporary relevance, because around the world there continue to be people who look to the biblical material, the theological traditions, other uh, religious resources, to shape and inform the way that they think about contemporary issues like transhumanism or technology or, or things like that. So how in practice would that work when you have an ancient text? How, how can that, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about transgender or transhumanism, mm. so how, how does that work in practice? Well, I think that's a really important and really significant question. And one of the, one of the things that really needs to be said immediately is that, um, Asking questions like that is never a simple thing to do. Uh, you can't find a text in the Bible that says what you think about transhumanism uh, or that, th that, that tells you what to think about uh, gene modification. Uh, that itself becomes really interesting because you're, you're very seldom approaching questions that are black and white or reducible to simple rights and wrongs. So you're actually learning to think in a fairly subtle and fairly complex way about complex issues. But what you need to do, really, is to go back to the material and think about some of the broad principles uh, that might bear on contemporary situations, some of the analogies to contemporary situations, um, but also the way in which these ancient thinkers frame similar questions or parallel questions in relation to their faith commitments uh, and in relation to the particular elements of their faith commitments that are linked for example, to the person of Jesus. So it would be more a matter of looking to the text to see if there was any wisdom that you could draw from it rather than direct information. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, for example, do an awful lot of work in the area of the Bible and autism. Now, autism is a condition that we've only really named in recent years. So it's not a condition that was, was known as such in the ancient world, even if it existed in the ancient world. Um, there are some people who, I think, misuse the Bible, either by trying to identify characters in the Bible who might have been autistic, or by trying to see things in the biblical stories that they think are, are um, fairly immediate parallels to the symptoms of autism. So you'll hear some horror stories, for example, of people who identify the symptoms of autism with demon possession. Um, and that can be, I think, fairly disturbing. Much more healthy, I think, is to recognise the way in which the New Testament material speaks about how uh, persons of faith are expected to uh, engage with people who are different to themselves, or the way in which the community uh, forms a sense of inclusion and belonging, uh, the commitments that shape that, and the way in which we are expected to care for people who have uh, specific needs. Um, so there's lots of interesting material, but very little of it comes out in the form of texts that very immediately or directly speak of the things that we're thinking about. Because we live in a world that's full of things that yeah. didn't exist in the ancient mm. world. So isn't it then arguably, or couldn't you be accused then of just reading things into the text rather than... Um, having a, an authoritative text on modern day issues, mm. you've got a text that you're determined to use and you end up kind of turning it into a symbol or a metaphor or... 
I think that's always a danger and that's why you have to learn to read the text properly. Uh, you can learn from the way in which the text has been read by the Christian tradition. And of course, when we're using the language of text here, we're not speaking about uh, one text with a single author. Uh, even where the Bible is identified as the Word of God, uh, there's an acknowledgement that, uh, that this divine word, if you like, um, was written through the agency of human beings who lived at particular times, in particular places, with particular circumstances. And you're always negotiating both the cultural difference between your situation and their situation, but you're also negotiating the question of how you read, for example, the book of Leviticus or Deuteronomy in relation to the story of Jesus. And of course, the story of Jesus contains elements of how he related these texts in, in distinction from some of his contemporaries, uh, whom he often argued with in very vocal terms. Something similar could be said about mm -hmm. Paul. So I think what you're seeking to do is to learn what it means to read the Bible responsibly, bearing in mind that you're not just reading one single text. And you're not reading, if you like, a manual or a handbook. You're reading a collection of books uh, some of which include commandments, some of which include stories, some of which include poems, uh, proverbs, all of these different things, and you're reflecting on what it means to read that responsibly and then apply it responsibly. And one of the things that I think is really important to say is that, um, you know, in, in today's society, certainly in the UK, and maybe particularly in the urban UK, we often think about religion as, as old-fashioned or as irrelevant, but we need to remember that around the world, the numbers of people who are religious mm -hmm. actually is growing. Mm -hmm. And in other, many other contexts, those people are actually very influential, including in political environments. I mean, you only need to look at American mm -hmm. politics mm -hmm. for a little bit of a window onto that. So you need to understand how people are drawing upon their faith commitments as they make moral decisions or public decisions. And if you disagree with those decisions, then you need to be able to dialogue with them mm -hmm. in a way that revolves around the question of whether they're using their faith resources wisely mm -hmm. or unwisely. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the issues that I encounter, for example, both in relation to something like autism and in relation to something like developing technology are often shaped by people whom, whom I think are misusing right. the Bible or right. misusing theology, uh, often by just reading it naively. Right, and, and I think that can bring the whole, um, the whole discipline into disrepute because that's the bit that people see in the news and not necessarily, it's not necessarily a responsible use of the yeah, text. Yeah, that's absolutely right. But uh, the antidote to that is not to acknowledge or accept or go along with the idea mm -hmm. that the whole thing is um, you know, inescapably bad, mm -hmm. but to recognize that history is full of people who drew upon this material in much more positive, mm -hmm. significant mm -hmm. ways. I mean, many of my colleagues here in Aberdeen work especially on the figure of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, who was uh, an influential figure in resisting Nazism and who drew crucially upon his faith in general, but upon the New Testament teaching about Jesus uh, as a real driving factor in his resistance. And of course, part of that recognizes that Jesus himself, whatever else he was, was socially a pretty revolutionary mm -hmm. figure. Mm -hmm. uh, and the history of Christianity reflects that. So rather than, I think, simply saying uh, there are lots of people who misuse the Bible or whose faith is clearly toxic, and uh, coming to the conclusion that all religion is toxic, I think we need to recognise that lots of people drew on this same material, mm -hmm. but in ways that were socially transformational, mm -hmm. uh, in ways that brought about real change. So the Bible, a source of wisdom for the individual, a journey of wisdom through, through looking at ancient stories that ancient people have drawn, and modern people still draw on in, for inspiration. Mm but also a text through which we can understand the modern world. Yeah, that's absolutely it. I mean, I think, you know, the fact is that millions of people around the world today still look to the Bible as something that norms and shapes and influences mm -hmm. their thought. 
even when they're dealing with things that nobody could have anticipated a hundred years ago even, you know, whether it's, whether it's your iPad or whether it's the kind of stuff that, that you encounter on the internet or whether it's a question like, um, like transhumanism or gene modification. People go back to the Bible to inform their thinking. But again, the crucial thing is uh, you need to do that in the right kinds of ways and you need to reflect on what makes a responsible reading and what makes an irresponsible mm -hmm. reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where studying theology, I think, is so important yeah. because it can help you to be reflective. On Filter. Th precisely. So you, you learn whether you're reading the Bible well, whether you're reading the Bible badly, and you learn to reflect on, on what, mm -hmm. what makes a good and a bad reading. And that's never as simple as, as right and wrong. Yeah. Uh, it involves thinking about a whole complex of different things. Obviously, divinity is a hugely popular subject here in Aberdeen. We're here in this amazingly elegant and beautiful library dedicated to the subject. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of things your students go on to do once they've left here with their degrees. Are, are they mainly going into um, minis becoming ministers and into the church mm. and that kind of profession? Or? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. And uh, I mean, I've taught here in Aberdeen, I've previously taught at, uh, at another university, and I think drawing on my experience here and there, actually only a small number of people who come through our doors go on to the kind of careers you would expect them to go on to. Only a small number go on to uh, some kind of ministry or some kind of role being paid for uh, by the church. Uh, most people go on to other careers, and in fact many people study divinity without a clear sense of the career they want to have in the end. But over the years, I've seen people going on to jobs in, um, in politics, in journalism, in tourism, uh, and jobs in the military, and plenty of other contexts as well. And in all of those cases, what they've found is that the, the knowledge they've acquired of religious traditions and of religious history has given them a, a very useful body of transferable knowledge that they can take to their skills. and transferable skills. I think that's the other thing, because they they have an awareness of lots of facts that other people maybe aren't aware of because they've studied the history of them. But they've also learned what it is to evaluate situations that are complicated, mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily reducible to black and white, and to understand where religion fits into people's reasoning, where their faith commitments, their sacred texts and their traditions do. So that's allowed them, for example, to be involved in the military and to understand the context in which they're stationed. It's allowed them to go on to jobs in tourism, where they're able to, to know something about the role of religion in the, uh, in the history and environment of a place. It's allowed them to go into journalism because they're, they're, they're very skilled at analysing the kinds of complicated situations that, that we see on the news all the time. Thank you very much indeed.